Chapter One of But Thy Love and Thy Grace. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Therese. But Thy Love and Thy Grace by Francis J. Finn, S. J. Chapter One. What should you take a chance on? Why, the diamond ring, of course. It's only ten cents a chance, and there's nothing near as nice in the whole bazaar. The speaker was a young lady presiding over one of the prettiest and gayest booths in the St. Joseph's Orphan Asylum Bazaar. She was addressing her remarks to a girl who, as any woman could tell by her dress, was of the working class. The girl had a pleasing face. The features were refined, the eyes soft, and of the tenderest blue, looking out mildly and kindly from dark silken arched lashes upon a world which wondered why face and habit should correspond so ill i might as well she answered i have twenty cents left and i'm going in a minute and i don't care about leaving with any money regina o'connell had come into that bazaar with three dollars and twenty cents it was not much to the bazaar but to the gentle girl it represented the savings of six months it represented all that she could spare for the orphans Regina wrote her name for two chances in the little book offered her, then paid her money. There now, she added with a little laugh, I am light of pocket, and, as far as the bazaar is concerned, I am through with it. The chance taken, Miss Margaret Dalton, who was prefect of the young lady's sodality, looked at Regina kindly. She was touched by the fragile beauty of the working girl. Wouldn't you like to look at the ring? she said. They all say it is a very pretty one. "'Thank you,' answered Regina gratefully. "'But I know you're busy, and I don't want to take up your valuable time.' Regina said, "'Valuable for valuable.' Out of deference to the kindly young lady, she was using her best words and pronouncing them according to her lights. "'Oh, it will be a pleasure to me to show it to you,' said Miss Dalton, taking the girl's hand as she spoke, and leading her toward that thing of beauty, the young lady's sodality booth." To make one's way through the crowd was no easy task. Wheels of fortune to right of them, wheels of fortune to left of them, a surging crowd all around and about them, many holding bats in their hands, many struggling to buy them, little boys who would get in the way, little girls who could not get out of it, a gentleman whispered to be running for office, surrounded by a knot of laughing girls, each waiting for her turn to hand him her chance book some five or six young men smilingly trying to escape from a zealous old lady who was endeavouring to impress them with the idea that a silk dress which she was raffling would fill a void in their lives all these things made progress onward a thing which required vigilance and determination it was indeed a pretty sight revealed by the hundreds of sputtering electric lights they shone upon faces which were on a parade of joy when people come to a bazaar it is only the first step that costs once they have determined on going, once that they have set aside the money, they intend spending, and strong of will and armed in triple brass, is he, who goes not beyond the limit he has set himself. The rest is a merry revel. If you wish to see for yourself that it is better to give than to receive, by all means go to a charity bazaar. Men and women pay high prices for things they do not want, and then chuckle over their extravagance. They are particularly happy when they pay something for nothing, and they become idiotically ecstatic when they have to borrow car fare to get home. An hour in a bazaar is a crowded hour of joyous life, an hour where every second registers joyous greetings and unexpected meetings, happy laughter, and delightful little jokes, which fizzle away like the foam in a newly opened bottle of champagne, and won't, in consequence, stand repetition. All this in a glory of flowers, in a wonder of colors, in a blaze of light, and a gleaming of eyes, and a shuffling of feet, and a hum of voices. Grief, for a season, bids the place farewell. She stands at the door without, stands so long that sometimes she falls asleep, and so lets her patrons depart unconcerned and merry. Through such a crowd and in such an hour did Regina and Miss Dalton not unsuccessfully struggle. Within five minutes they had made over fifteen feet, I couldn't do better than you, Miss Dalton, in ground gaining, the best day I ever played on the gridiron, said Fred Morris, the great halfback of the St. Francis College team, whom the young men of the city worshipped, and of whom the older citizens had never heard. Indeed, 
said Miss Dalton sweetly, but not at all appreciating the compliment. Had he made a speech in Syrochaldic, she would have understood him equally well. At this juncture, an unexpected diversion attracted the surging crowd to another part of the building, leaving the immediate neighborhood of the young lady's sodality booth comparatively deserted, and Regina and Miss Dalton free to continue their progress without let or hindrance. They were standing presently before the large showcase of the wondrous booth. High on a throne of state, in the very center of the case, out from its blue, fluffy, satin lined box, gleamed the diamond upon a dainty gold ring. Regina's face lighted up, her eyes grew very big, and opened very large. Oh, isn't it lovely? No woman could have said less, or more. Perhaps you would like to have it in your hand, continued the sympathetic Miss Dalton. Her heart had warmed to the poor girl. Oh, don't put yourself to any trouble on my account, miss, answered Regina, still keeping her sparkling eyes on the diamond. How I should like to win it! Miss Dalton quietly slipped behind the counter, opened the case, and taking the ring from its box, handed it to the girl. Regina looked at it long, intently, hungrily. The diamond glittered in the light. When she raised her eyes, there were three diamonds glittering, at least, so thought a genial old Irishman, who had just lightened his purse and his heart by taking a chance on a picture rich in reds and destitute of the least vestige of green. So a parking charity carry a patriot. Sure, miss, he said to Regina as she raised her eyes. Sure, miss, that diamond would be lost in your little hand, for the buys would be looking at your shining eyes all the time, and wouldn't be looking at the ring at all, at all. The old man was then captured by a woman with a book, and so missed the chance of commenting on the rich blush which purpled Regina's cheeks. This diamond must be worth hundreds and hundreds of dollars, she said. I wish it were, answered Miss Dalton, suppressing a smile. It is valued at sixty-five dollars. Is that all? If I had it, I'd not sell it for that. No, indeed. I should be delighted if you were to win it. Thank you, miss. You are very kind. I don't know you, but your face is very familiar. Poor Regina got that word very badly, to me, and I don't feel as if you was a stranger. And I know your face very well, too, answered Miss Dalton, of set purpose avoiding the word familiar. If I'm not mistaken, you go to Father McNichols to confession. Oh, that's where I've seen you. I couldn't place you at first. But now I remember I seen you at church last Saturday evening. You're one of his penitents, aren't you? Yes, I've gone to him for a year. He has done a lot of good to me. He makes me come every week. Miss Dalton gazed at Regina more sympathetically than ever, as the girl again fell to contemplating the glittering diamond ring. Miss Dalton belonged to one of the leading Catholic families of the city. She was refined, of such a refinement, indeed, that she could go out of her own walk of life into the slums without rubbing off or tarnishing the bloom thereof. Here is another case, she reflected, of the loveliness born of frequent confession and communion. This poor child belongs to the tenements. She has lived, perhaps, amid scenes of squalor and drunkenness. Everything about her should have made her coarse and vulgar. Doubtless, she left school at the age of thirteen, and doubtless for a time she promised to go wrong, and became coarse. Then a confessor got a hold on her, and persuaded her to frequent the sacraments. And now she is pure and modest and gentle, and just as refined as any girl can be, who has hardly more than a bowing acquaintance with words of three syllables. I think I'll cultivate her. She's worth a hundred educated girls who think only of themselves. My name is Margaret Dalton, she said aloud. Would you mind telling me yours? Oh, no, I'm Regina O'Connell. I'm glad to make your acquaintance, Regina. It's fair we should know each other, since we sit beside each other in the church so often. Do you like going to confession every week? I didn't at first, answered Regina, returning the ring to Margaret. It took Father Nichols a long time to get me to do it. You see, I used to go out so much on Saturday night. I'm ashamed to think of it now. Those balls are horrible. You didn't think so when you went to them, I dare say. No, but I had no sense. Not that I have much now, for that matter. How long have you been working? 
since I was eleven. My father wasn't doing nothing, and my sister got taken down with some spinal trouble, and so I went and said I was thirteen. Don't be shocked, miss, but I didn't mind a lie more or less then, and got a position in a shoe factory, and I've been working there ever since, seven years. Do you like it? I have to. We're left alone now, me and my sister, and she's bedridden, poor thing, and the doctor says she won't last long. Oh, she's lovely and so patient. She never complains and never asks for anything, and she's praying nearly all the time. She's worth working for, and you can stick a pin in that. Regina colored, unrealizing that her last statement was couched in terms not quite suited to the occasion and to her companion. Is your sister alone all day? Most of the time she is, miss, but she says she is never lonely. She says her beads, and then the office of the Immaculate Conception, and then she has a book called Visits to Jesus in the Tabernacle. Father Lassance's book? I think that's the one. A lady was in the house about a year ago, and happened to see her, and sent her the book. She reads out of it for an hour or two every morning. Then in the afternoon she reads story books part of the time, and I think she does a lot of praying. On Sundays, though, there are lots of the factory girls who come to see her, and they are just lovely to her. They bring her flowers and fruit and cake, and they talk so nice in her room. Some of them talk pretty coarse at work, and some of them use pretty bad language, but they are good at heart, every one of them. I'm sure they are, said Miss Dalton, much better than people who would sneer at them. They are so unselfish. Once when Rose, that's my sister's name, was very sick, they took turns in staying up with her, two of them every night and they went to work next day as though they had done nothing out of the usual. It's wonderful how kind everyone is to us. Won't you please take her these flowers? said Miss Dalton, bringing up from beneath the table a bunch of violets. Oh, cried the girl, her eyes again outrivaling the diamond. How good you are! She just loves violets and hasn't seen any since last year. These are very early, and they do smell lovely. Thank you, Miss Dalton. And now I think I had better go. By the way, would you mind my calling to see your sister some day? Mind? I was tempted to ask you, but I didn't like to. Very well. Please write the address on this card. It's in a tenement on Main Street, third floor back, murmured Regina apologetically, as she wrote her address. Oh, by the way, miss, if you really let me have one of those books with chances on the diamond ring— I think I could try to have it filled out among my lady friends. In saying lady friends, poor Regina thought she was particularly happy. Miss Dalton could forgive more than that. If you fill out this book, she said, you will be a benefactor of our booth, and we shall be very grateful to you. I think I can do it, said Regina. Some of the girls won't come to the bazaar, but it's not because they do not feel kindly toward the poor little orphans. Some are ashamed on account of their clothes and others because they haven't enough to spend. But there are plenty of them who will only be too glad to take a few chances, no matter on what. I'm going to talk up the diamond ring, and I'm sure it will get them interested. Miss Dalton had not quite succeeded in dismissing from her imagination this poor, bright-eyed, eager girl, when Father McNichols greeted her. Ah, Miss Dalton, this is no time for contemplation. Action is the order of the hour. I am surprised to see the prefect of the sodality bowed in thought, when she should of all women be up and doing. I will act on your advice at once, father. Here is my book of chances on the diamond ring. Perhaps you would like to put your name down. No, I should not. What should I do with a diamond ring? However, I will take a few chances. Father McNichols took the book and glanced at the numbers. Whose name shall I put down? He said, half to himself. Regina O'Connell's, answered Miss Dalton promptly. Regina O'Connell? Never heard of her in my life. But you have heard her many a time, Father. She's a little working girl and one of your penitents. Then she must be a very good girl indeed, commented the Father affably. Yes? Why, of course. All working girls are good. Never met any other sort since I was ordained. Well, Regina certainly is very good. She supports a sick sister, and works hard, and gets no pleasure in life, and is perfectly resigned and cheerful. 
she's a frail little creature too and reminds me of a premature white and pink blossom in early april please don't say she gets no pleasure in life miss dalton if as you say she is a weakly communicant i am confident that god's love and grace make up for the things that are wanting in her narrow life it is wonderful how generous god often is in filling with his heavenly consolations those whom he does not fill with bread it is the rich that he sends away hungry i am afraid sighed miss dalton that some of us have already received our reward there continued father mcnichols after a pause during which he was busily writing i put miss regina o'connell's name down for ten chances i'm going to tell her what you've done next time i see her you will do nothing of the sort cried father mcnichols oh if you object day interrupted the priest on second thought i believe you are right the girl is my penitent you say perhaps knowing of this she will be better affected toward me and be more willing to take advice who knows but i may be called on to say hard things to her yes you may tell her i certainly will and father the poor girl was so delighted with the diamond so anxious to win it i intend to put her down for five chances every day until the end of the bazaar and i'm going to get my sisters and brothers interested too and then when some man comes along who is spending his money simply out of charity you might suggest regina's name some men are grateful for little hints good-bye and good luck to you and all your undertakings End of chapter 1